Okay, um, so, um, we, we might have to finish early actually because, um, <laughs> we might have to finish early because my uh, PhD student, um, Lin Xin, has brought me some Chinese food which is currently, I believe, still warm. <laughs> so, um, we might have to, honestly, I know it's there, <laughs> To celebrate the um, Chinese New Year, so um, I'm, I'm going all like faint. Because I'm, give me dumpling, right? Okay, so anyway, so we know that it's authentic Chinese food, right? Because Lin Xin made it. If I made it, it wouldn't be authentic. Here's the question, right? If I'm in China and I make Chinese food, is it authentic Chinese food? No, it's interesting, we could, I haven't put like food as a topic on the module, but food is a really interesting thing around debates around authenticity, isn't it? Like, this restaurant, not this restaurant, and, and so on and so on. And then it's not just like East-West, it's like anyone, you know, any food, Italian food, German food, whatever food. But, for now, so we've moved with, with um, Chris uh, Go to jones we move from the history of magic to the future. So he um, has done lots of studies as well of um, things like computer gaming um, and the topic of one of his uh, essays is called Playing with Being in Digital Asia. Um, so playing with being, like being, this is a term that, the, the, the notion of being is something that's going to come back to us next week. It's a, it's a European philosophical question, what is being? Like what is the, the European philosophical question of metaphysics was, what is the being of the entity? <coughs> and that kind of organized an entire academic field for hundreds of years. We'll get to that next week. It's a stupid question, but it's nonetheless a European question. What is the being of the entity? So, playing with being in digital Asia. Um, so... Uh, Go to Jones is really great to, to read because he gives you he gives you a lot of um, um, interesting points about traditional conceptions of Orientalism and the tra traditional study of it. Um, and he notes that even the term Asia, as a category, as a as a word, and as a category of place, you look at a map and you point at it and go Asia. That's a colonial term. That's a, a European imperial term. It's well known that Asia was coined to label the zones outside conventional European experience. Asia and alien tend together at this science fictional frontier, the site of othering experience and knowledge. The name Asia originated outside Asia and its heteronymous origin is indubitably inscribed in the concept of Asia. Now that's an interesting Theoretic, there's a load of interesting things going on there, I think. Asia is an is a entire supposed region named by Europeans. It's a co therefore, it's a European concept, or Europe reflects a European um, way of organising the world. And it's semiotically connected with the idea of the alien, the outside, that they're the really foreign. So, that's why I put... Um, I was almost going to say Fu Manchu, that's not Fu Manchu, this is Ming the Merciless. So Ming the Merciless was Flash Gordon's enemy. Flash Gordon was one of the earliest American science fiction cartoons. It's like a strip cartoon, you know, a, a magazine, a cartoon cartoon, comic, a comic book. And it became, it became serialised on television. And... Ming, the, I've done this. I've told you this before, but it, it's it's astonishing that you have these literary characters such as Fu Manchu, produced in the um, late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, and these are bad guys, Sherlock Holmesian type. Like he's kind of like Moriarty, but 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 Chinese. Um, and Fu, and in this image of the alien, the science fictional character par excellence <laughs> has Asian characteristics throughout Western representations. Spock, well you've got Fu Manchu, Spock, Ming the Merciless, and loads of others. 
minor, lesser luminaries, lesser characters. So there's a connection, there's this strange connection between the most other and the most alien. So alienation has the word alien in it, and it. Um, while it may no longer be the case, at least in principle, that 21st century Asia is subjugated to the dominance of the so-called West, the logic of this artificial binary remains rooted in a politics of imperialism. It is naive to affect a reading of Asia that is amnesiac about its conceptual history. The historical alienation and the colonization of Asia by the West it's not something accidental to the essence of Asia. It is essential to the possibility called Asia. So that's quite a dense sentence or two there. Um, but it's the kind of thing that, that I really want us to reflect on. Um, that kind of, the way in which Orientalism is based on the creation of a differential, a drawing a line, a binary, that is both real and unreal. Like, there definitely are other cultures, there definitely are other geographical places, but when you draw that line and you go, on this side you've got Europe, and on this side it's not Europe. You've, you've done something, you've, you've created a way of thinking. It's not just a, like a, a straightforward, um, neutral representation. It, it, it produces conceptual effects. Um, so that's, and that, this is kind of a really fundi fundamental thing that I want to see in your work, like the grasping of this, like the, the grasping of this, the sense in which identities are produced through these differentials. Um, East and West are very vague terms, they're not geographical terms exactly. Um, they, re they more reflect westernised versus something else. Um, there was a tradition, there was a... There's, if you go to the library and Google Easternization, you'll find this like there was a, there was a short-lived tradition of, of Western academics trying to theorise whether like the West was being Easternised, and it was a really bizarre kind of a moment in in conceptual history. But nonetheless, these things exist. Um, so, is signifying Asia the same thing as stigmatising Asia? Um, the aroma of Japaneseness that surrounds staples of techno Asianism. So I've, I've emphasised the term techno Asianism because um, an interesting thing about um, cultural Orientalism is that Orientalism can often signify the oldest history, the ancient cultures, Asia, the ancient these oldest religions, oldest languages, right? Oldest texts, oldest architecture, and all of that stuff. It also signifies the future. So if you think of Western science fiction, um, if you think of um, Star Trek, think of all that stuff, the Asian was also connected with the future. Now there are... Um, and a number of other things. A lot of that is determined by 20th century history, and things like the Second World War, um, and what was forced upon countries. So, so Japan militarized and um, expanded um, militarily through the, the early 20th century, and it culminated in the, in the Second World War, war with America. And after the Second World War, America effectively occupied most of Japan, and there was that like, you can't have any weapons, can't do you can't, just can't do any of that shit. So Japan was kind of forced to invest in developing itself as a technological economy. So Japan and technology became kind of synonymous for a lot of the time during the 20th century. And Japan came to be a country that symbolised the future: robots, lasers, computers, these things. Through the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And, and Japan was expanding, it was like, oh wow, this is a real kind of economic threat to the, to the global dominance of the United States of America. And you, that's when was developed what, the, what is being called here, techno-Asianism, like the, the connection of countries like Japan, especially Japan, 
with technology and therefore with the future, with science and science fiction. And you get genres coming along like cyberpunk, Ghost in the Shell, the Matrix eventually, and so on and so on. So even the aroma of Japaneseness that surrounds stables of techno-Asianism such as anime, manga and digital games is without substance, sharing no necessary or sufficient connection with Japan. So when we think of these Japanese things, there's absolutely no reason why they are in any way connected with actual Japan, either the Japanese place, Japanese people, Japanese stuff, none of it. An implication of this is that the consideration of these products as Japanese or Asian involves a political moment. Rather than operating as a descriptive, locative qualifier, Asian works evaluatively to deprivilege, or privilege and deprivilege, particular products as in need of additional or atypical analytic attention. So his argument here is that as soon as you specify a kind of cultural difference, you single it out for that different kind of attention, you kind of impute to it or imbue it with a difference that might not necessarily be a, a real thing. Um, he talks about this in the, in the next paragraph, um, in, in the next slide. Um, and this is, so this is not just a, um, so if you, well, we'll get to the, I've quoted from this. So one of the chief dangers of, the, of construction such as Asia is the question of who has the power to produce it and hence also the question of out of whom is it produced. So whenever we think of anything, <coughs> of any culture, I guess, but in this context we're talking about Asia, who made that representation? We're back to Flaubert and his representation of the exotic oriental woman again. Like, who made the representation uh, and who was kind of silenced from it or excluded from it? But this is, again, it isn't simply a one-way street. Um, so reverse or self-orientalism fits into a pre-existing ideological discourse in Japan known as Nihon Jinron, Essays on Japanese Uniqueness, which has its modern origins in the imperial period. So it's not just Westerners who have imputed to Japan a unique status and said this is a really different culture or these are really different people. It's also a bit of a two-way street. There's this long tradition of Japanese writing, Nihon Jinron, which is all about Japanese uniqueness. <coughs> so intellectually and culturally, the Japanese have for a long time said, yeah, we are unique, we are different. We're different from all of you, especially the Koreans. <laughs> We're better than them, right? And the Koreans have said, no, you're not. You're worse than us. We're better than you because we hate you. Um, so, like, so Japan and, and Korea is very much entrenched in, in the horrible, violent history between the two countries. But they're locked in a one-upmanship, cultural battle all the time. We're better than you. We invented it first. Um, <laughs> honestly, I've been to conferences in Japan and in, in, in South Korea where the academics come and go, see Kendo, we invent that. <laughs> honestly, like, see the samurai... Well, recent documents that I discovered prove that there's an older Korean tradition of the Samurang who are better than the Samurai. <laughs> and the Chinese are sitting there going, yeah, well, we did, we did it all ages ago. We got bored of it. We got bored of it and gave it to you. Everything you're into, I was into much longer ago. So, where this question of cultural difference and cultural uniqueness and who invents the image... It's, there's often, we're going we're gonna to be circling around over the next week or two and throughout the module, questions of nationalism too and how do you construct your national identity. We've already looked at, slightly quickly, Tai Chi and pandas. There's also anime, manga, kendo. There's all, the, you name it. There's dumplings. I mustn't digress. I must crack on. Um... And it poses interesting questions, the same questions uh, about geographically, in the, in the actual existing world, in the globe, where is Asia? Where is East and where is West? Because these are very, very 
shifting in slippery terms. And Goatee Jones says, rather than being a location in the cartographic sense, digital Asia, so this is computer game Asia, um, might be considered a quality of experience. In particular, given that we are concerned with our presence in an interactive location, this quality might be not only aesthetic, but also somatic. Soma aesthetic. It's a good word, I like that word. The meaning of digital Asia could be contained in a particular soma aesthetic quality. When we ask where, we might, oh, we might find digital Asia then. Uh, sorry, where we might find digital Asia then. The answer could be here, embodied within us. What does that mean, Paul? Well, I think it means lots of different things. It means that sense of disappointment when you go into an authentic Japanese restaurant, and it could just be any restaurant. You're like, oh, I didn't want that. I wanted kimonos and plinky plunky music. That's what I wanted, right? It's all when you... You want, like, how do we get a sense of something being authentic? And it's in the trappings of it. Is this an authentic restaurant? Is this an authentic lesson? Is this an authentic dojo? We want these trappings because they create the sense. The kind of aesthetic sense that enables us to feel um, like we are, say, in Asia or in an authentic location. Um... It's about a structure of feeling, so the term that I am bringing to this is, is structure of feeling, and this comes from um, a British, uh, Welsh actually, um, cultural critic called Raymond Williams. And Raymond Williams wrote about structures of feeling, and it's a, there's a, a book called uh, Marxism and Literature, and the chapter in that is called Structures of Feeling, and it is fantastic, it's a fantastic account of what a structure of feeling is, uh, and, and, and it's normal in this sense, we're connecting with a place, we're connecting with a feel of a place, cultural trappings, we want the decor to look right, we want the people to look right, we want it to sound right, this kind of aesthetic environment, it's habitus, if you will, that's what we think of if we say like, Japanese-ness or Chinese-ness or whatever, something vague like Asian-ness. Um, it's about this kind of the, constructed, the constructedness of it. But it's not something that, it's, it's quite a complex thing because like, you know, if we are um, it's like I mentioned last week, I think, if we are, you know, at Dublin Airport, right, and there's a, there's a, like a, a traditional Irish pub be Jesus or be Gara, right? <laughs> In Dublin Airport. You know it's not authentic. You know it's not real oak. You know it's not an old pub that's been there for 200 years or more. You know it's a simulation. But it's kind of in Ireland, so is it acceptable kind of thing? And like, you know, if you go around a stately home or something, you go around an arboretum, you've got a Westenburg Arboretum in wherever it is. Um, and, and, you, and you're walking through, like, I don't know, Japanese gardens and stuff. It still doesn't feel like Japan, because you kind of know it's not. You kind of fetishize the location as well. But the point of this structure of feeling argument is that if you're in a computer game, I guess, if you're in a computer game or you're watching a film, you need certain things to be present, what the psychoanalyst like Slavoj Žižek would call fetishes. We need these fetishistic features before we accept that we are really experiencing something authentic. These fetishes. We'll do we'll do Zizek, Zizek in a couple of weeks. So says Go to Jones. No matter who we are, we all bring with us various expectations about what digital Asia, or indeed any Asia, or indeed any place, will feel like when we go in search of it. Just like travellers uh, to analog Asia, and for these terms, digital Asia and analog Asia, you could insert almost anything there. You know, wherever you go, looking for your authentic experience in that place. You've got your pre-expectations, your hopes and fears, your handful of things that you know about a place that you definitely have to see. You know, you go, uh, I'm going to go to Paris, right? What, what do I know about Paris? I, Eiffel Tower, and that church thing on the hill, <laughs> some sacre coeur, <laughs> or as my daughter said the other day, sacre bleu. So I didn't like sacre bleu. 
She said, that was when someone stole my hat. I said, no, it's when you lost your hat and you decided that someone else had stolen. Sacre bleu in Paris. Um, and we fantasise about the things that we have to go and see, otherwise we haven't done that place properly, right? We've got to do the things. Did he do the catacombs now? Oh, I get claustrophobic. So, indeed, one of the great contributions of Edward Said's theory of Orientalism was to draw our attention to the ways in which we rarely encounter an other naively. The quality, significance and meaning of our encounter is mediated by our pre-existing expectations of that other, which we may have drawn from a particular cultural artefact, a specific novel, travelogue, textbook or movie, or from a less specific general cultural atmosphere. For Said, the Orient was the archetypal case, but for us today we might consider digital Asia as in the same light. Now this relates to what one of the texts that we're going to look at next week, um, Ray Chow's argument in Brushes with the Other as Face. We never encounter another culture completely naively. We've always got a sense of what it should look like, what it should sound like, what it's going to feel like to be there. Um, but at the same time, actually, there's a flip side to that, which is, this is anecdotal, right? And maybe, this is, it's anecdotal but significant. So, um, like before the pandemic, just before the pandemic, when we could still travel and everything, I went to California. Now, I've seen California on the television lots. Like, it's most of the television, right? It's most of the films. And I never got it, like, I never got the big deal. It looked a bit shit. It just got, I'm like, that looks awful. I don't want to go there. It looks shit. Why does everyone say it's so special? And, but when I got there, and I got there really late at night, and then I got the taxi, and I'm trying to like read the neighbourhood going, is this a rough neighbourhood or is this a set? What kind of neighbourhood is this? Am I in danger here? Because you can't read the signs, right, in another culture. You don't know if you're safe or about to be murdered, right? You just don't know that. And you don't know if that's a police officer or a, a postman or something, right? You just can't tell who, who's what. Anyway, and I got out of the taxi at um, about 11 o'clock or midnight and I had, had no key. I didn't know where I was meant to be. I had no instructions. And I was thinking, this feels really nice. Like, I'm really scared because I think I might be sleeping on the street tonight because I don't know how to get into this place. Um, but I just got it. Like, you're on the ground going, oh, this feels nice. And it's something that could not be captured or had not been captured for me in, like, cinematic representation. Like, how nice it feels to be in the nicer, posh bits of Los Angeles, right? Do you know what I mean? So this is something as well, actually. So next week, the question is, what can media, like film, capture? Can it capture the structure of feeling? Now, what Goto Jones is talking about is the way in which, like, digital animated graphics and, and computer games and stuff capture a certain quality of experience and create a certain structure of feeling. But that maybe that's, that's also different, again, from being on the street, feeling a place. Do you know what I mean? Something to think, we'll talk about that, possibly, hopefully. Um, and this is a photograph from um, an old western style shooting range, like a, a western cowboy type village um, in a theme park in Japan. When we look for an encounter in digital Asia, we already have a sense of what this will mean, and what it should feel like, because we've decided what it should feel like. The reverse of this is also true. When we encounter something that we are told is digital Asia, even though it does not conform to our expectations, we resist. <coughs> this requires a complex, active response from us. If we are told that a video game set in the American Wild West is part of digital Asia because it was designed, developed and produced in Japan, we are likely to resist by saying that it is not really Japanese, it does not feel or look Japanese. So we associate these senses of an essence, like a cultural essence, like a quintessentially Japanese, quintessentially English, quintessentially whatever, French, with 
visual semiotic cliches and conventions. Just not happy unless it feels authentically Parisian in Paris or, you know, is there a New York in New York? I don't know. But you know what I mean. Oh, well, it's something that I want you to, to try and work out what I mean. Um, <clears throat> which poses the question of the relationship between reality and fantasy. This is an interesting question. And it's a psychoanalytic question. It's also it's like a psychological and cultural question. It's also Edward Said's question. Said's argument is that there are long traditions of certain forms of fantasy about the Middle East. And fantasy not just in the, in the explicit sense of like, I am consciously having a fantasy about something, but like ways of imagining it. So fantasy in that sense is a way of imagining the imagery that's conjured up. So I chose, I think I googled something like Japan, fantasy, safe search, yes please. Uh, whatever it was. And come up with this kind of stuff, these kind of aesthetics. Nowhere real actually looks like this, but it's not alien to our thinking about Japanese-ness. It's got a lot of the features there. So the material fact emphasised in the original text. The material fact of its Japanese-ness becomes incidental in the face of our ideological commitments. So the identification of something as correctly this can be this could be English, could be Welsh, could be Chinese, could be Japanese, could be Vietnamese, Thai, Indonesian, Malaysian, whatever. Is an ideological commitment. Our aesthetic investment in it is also our ideological commitment. What we think it should look like, what we think it should sound like, what we think people should behave like, these reflect kind of a cultural fantasy that's also an ideology. Japanese-ness is not a category controlled by Japan, but rather by our idea of Japan, whoever we are. Now, we might be policy makers in Japan. We might be powerful people in cultural agencies, cultural industries in Japan. Or we might be filmmakers in Hollywood. Or we might be people wondering where we should go on holiday, and what we should do when we go to Japan, what we should see. Well, we should go in March, April, right? See the cherry blossom. Mm -hmm. It's just like the busiest time of year in Japan, because everyone has to go and see the cherry blossom. This idea of Japan appears to be sustained and propagated by global capitalism rather than any particular national identity. So our senses of places are often... that You can't divorce them from, from consumerism, from tourism, from commercialisation, and also from, from national cultural policies of all kinds. National self-representation. So, to be clear, if we have gone on a journey so far, what time is it? What time do we finish? Ten, quarter past one-ish. That should be all right. Um, we've gone from Edward Said's notion of Orientalism as the awful, nasty West misrepresenting a pure, innocent East to now go on, everyone's playing this game. We have, like, this is the game. The game is kind of self-Orientalism. If Orientalism means dressing up in fantasy outfits, you know, like this, this could this could be like uh, this could be a British person putting on some kind of trilby and whatever. And uh, sorry, I've just my, my thought process has just been hijacked by Clockwork Orange, um, performing their Englishness, or um, the recent fashion in China, Hanfu, where you dress up in traditional Han ethnic. Clothes, right? It's like that's the new fashion. We'll, we'll maybe look at that in seminars. Um, these inventions of tradition. So they're, um, they're active. They're active and they're changeable, arguably. So techno-orientalism, this is another term. The popular imagination of the relationship between Asia and technology has an intricate history. I, I gave you some of the, point, some of the points before. This relationship has shifted significantly since the 1980s, since the so-called digital revolution. So, Sohn, who Gautam Jones is quoting from, observes, In traditional Orientalism, the East is often configured as backwards, anti-progressive and primitive, while the imagination of techno-Orientalism in the digital mode often portrays Asia, and especially Japan, 
are so progressive and advanced that it begins to resemble a vision of the future itself. Um, my major problems when, I, when I've been in Japan and South Korea is actually getting a toilet to flush. Because they're like, there's more technology in the toilet in Japan than there is in any other aspect of my life. And I can't read Japanese. And you kind of go, oh shit. <laughs> How do I get rid of this? It's a nightmare. It's a disaster. It's, anyway, techno Japan, techno toilets. Um, now, the, but this techno, <coughs> techno orientalism flips over into traditional kind of maybe racism. I put the word inscrutability up there in, in, in scare quotes. Inscrutability. It's a, it's a cliche. It's a racist trope. Um, you still sometimes hear it in like news reports, journalists talking about like you know, the Chinese ambassador was inscrutable, right? This kind of thing. It's a traditional thing. Inscrutable means you can't read it. You don't know how to read it. You can't interpret it. You can't. And the idea of the inscrutable Chinese is a classic Western racist trope, which is you can't read them. You can't. And we look at you can. Some of you will look at this if some of you plow on through the reading for next week in more depth. With this depiction of Asians as technologically advanced has come the assertion of a retarded sense of human development in Asia. Asians begin to resemble technologized non-humans. This is something that was very familiar to me when I was growing up. And Japan, the Japanese economy was the fastest growing economy in the world. And, and, and the, certainly in the British context, the news, current affairs programs were obsessed with the Japanese, going, and, and it would paint them as, as kind of almost inhuman, because the Japanese, remember, in the Second World War, they were kamikazes. So what is a kamikaze? In the Second World War, it's a Japanese fighter pilot who realises that uh, he's been shot or whatever, he's not going to get home safely, so he uses his plane as a weapon, like Twin Towers style, into the American military boats or whatever. Kamikaze. Suicidal dedication to the mission. This stereotype became one of the stereotypes of the Japanese. And, and in the West, certainly in the 80s, like the media was on about this, like, shit. Who are these people who are relentlessly, like, they're workaholics, they're incredibly efficient, they're blah, 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 blah. And it was like, it's not racist, but it's very, it's very culturally stereotyping. So the idea that they're somehow, they're different to us. They're less human because they're more community and more company and more nation focused. And this was a stereotype that was actually fostered in Japan as well, quite proactively. Yes, we are samurai, right? Which that, that the, the the reinvention of the samurai ideology was something that happened um, in the 20th century. Even as these alien slash Asians conduct themselves with superb technological efficiency and capitalist expertise, their affectual absence, the, the sense of them not being there somehow, resonates as an undeveloped, or worse still, a retrograde humanism. The contemporary political unconscious of the West has rendered Japan as the figure of empty and dehumanized technological power, the alienated and dystopian image of capitalist progress. Hmm. So, Japan then can come to signify, certainly the Japan of the 80s, can come to signify a terrifying vision of the future, of the future, where everything's efficient, everything's computerized, everything's robotic, but we somehow lose some kind of essence of, of humanness. So, it, these, these tropes flip around. Um, cyberpunk was a, cyberpunk kind of really exploded in the 80s um, with these images of this always orientalized, always kind of techno Japan versions of um, the, the near future. Um, and these were often western representations but not always so what, what Chris Goto Jones talks about is the way in which this becomes a kind of discursive um, interplay of imagery of subversive humanity and uh, our relationships with technology. 
So Blade Runner, if you've seen Blade Runner, I think, what do we, do we think, that the new Blade Runner, the 20, do we think, no? You haven't seen it? The new Blade Runner, is that cyberpunk as well? Uh, maybe, no. The first Blade Runner, though, maybe, maybe. New Romancer, The Matrix, these kinds of things, that's all cyberpunk. Um, so, I've got all the time, is it? Skip over some of it, I think. But, the issue is, or one of the issues, one of the big issues is, that techno-orientalism as a new kind of, more recent um, kind of orientalism, or kind of way of thinking about the aesthetics and the culture of um, Asia, in particular perhaps Japan, can't be divorced from an older Orientalist history of Yellow Perils. So the, the term the Yellow Peril was first used in the 1900s when the colonial European powers, especially the British, but also the Americans as well, um, started to worry about what would happen if, if China actually got its shit together and started to fight back. So you had in the, at the turn of the century, in the, the early 1900s, things like all these different rebellions, Taiping, Taipei, and the Boxer rebellions, which were anti-foreigner rebellions. So China's never been completely dominated by another uh, Euro by European power, but a lot of its ports, Hong Kong, Macau, and all these areas around it, were kind of controlled by um, European powers. Where's the best beer in China from? Qingdao, German colony. Hmm. Um, Qingdao. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's a German colony. Ger German, anyway. Um, so the, the, the point is that the new versions often reflect and replay established <coughs> versions. So these kind of structures of, of, of Orientalism in which the other is an area of both fascination and kind of desire, exoticide, also scary, it's also a scary version of the future. And Go To Jones looks at the kind of briefly looks at the history of American um, comic books like Flash Gordon um, and Buck Rogers in the 25th century, all of whom had either Asian or Pan Asian enemies. So. Um, the concept of the Pan-Asian was, was um, actualized in a 1949 comic strip called Sixth Column. Um, and there's this kind of common theme that you can see this Orientalism in, in, in popular culture, in American popular culture. Sort of vaguely non-specified fear and fascination. Fear of and fascination with Asia and its potentials. Because, well, well who should be in charge? Well, you know the British or, or the Americans should be in charge, right? Um, I re I wa Independence Day was on was on last week and I watched it again. And in Independence Day you've got the aliens who come in and they hover over over cities and then they and they zap them and they zap New York and they zap Washington DC and they zap Paris and everything. Um, and then and then they start the the, the um, Jeff Goldblum breaks the code and they start to kind of mold and decides to put a computer virus in the I'm going to give it a cold and he gives the aliens a cold and they send messages around the world and you see this there's, there's the British troops <laughs> where are the British troops? We're in, we're in Iraq right? and it's like there's a message it's from the Americans we're going to launch a counter assault well it's a bad time by Drew what's their plan? and it's like of course the Americans should be in charge and of course it should be the British who they speak to because of our special relationship um, against the aliens. It's a digression. I don't want to digress anymore. I want to. Um, have we got time to do this? I'll do this, and then we'll do our case studies. Um, this is a theme that will come back over the next few weeks as well. The question of the spirit. So historically, um, there's a there's a branch of Orientalism which looks to the East for spirituality and spiritual meaning, deeper meaning in your yoga, meditation, qigong, tai chi, stuff, deeper meanings. And this becomes 
this is Chris Goto Jones' argument. This becomes kind of transformed in cyberpunk and in techno orientalist fiction and literature and computer games and um, so on as a kind of um, it becomes a type of spirituality that's kind of networked. So the person who can control the networks, like Neo at the end of the first Matrix, where he can see the code and control the code, that becomes articulated as a new kind of spirituality, a new kind of spiritualism. Um, and I might come back to this in, a, in another lecture. I want to get to our case studies. We've got plenty of time for our case studies. So all these slides are there. You can have a look at that and we can talk about it if you want. I want to look at two case studies um, and have a think. And these are just everyday common or garden case studies uh, and see what we can see in them now. So we've been on this journey. It's been emotional. And we've come through this long lecture now. And we've, we now know everything about Orientalism. Want to look at this? This is an advert. Semioticians, what do we see in that? Do we see digital Asia? Do we see, or is that an Orient? Do you want to watch it again? Because now we know what it's for. Let's watch it again. What do we hear? Should I just do this rhetorical question answer with myself? It's that kind of Western concept. Yeah, I mean that's that. It's it's some kind of pipes, some kind of strings. I mean, it's just like I mean, if there was a gong there, we we would have been really in business. That would have been like the jackpot, wouldn't it? So, the listen to the sounds again and look. What are we looking at? What does it sound like? So we've already, in how many seconds? One or two? A couple of seconds. Ooh, some kind of harp or something. And then babbling water, carp splashing around, looking tranquil. Um, water lily, is that I guess? Water lily. Now. Name that character. It's a panda, isn't it? It's almost like I knew this was coming. It's a panda with two other pandas. That's three pandas. What are the pandas doing? Right? They haven't gone much room, but look. What a strange place to do Tai Chi. Um, where are they? Like, if, if we had to take some clues, where are they, do you think? It's, it's kind of odd because, like, pandas are connected with China, but the mountains kind of connected with Mount Fiji, maybe? Cherry Blossom is often more sensitive. And it's somebody else will be that, you know, uh, connected to Japan and felt in China most of the time. So it's kind of just... It, we might well be in digital Asia. Right? So that, it looks eerily like Mount Fuji, which is in Japan. There might, that might actually be an exact representation of a mountain in China, but I don't know. Because in China, semiotically, they tend to go for the more Guilin type, like ultra pointy, like almost Thai style of, of mountains, right? Don't they? I mean, they, they're on stamps and everything. Like Guilin is the, oh, we should have done the Guilin advert as well. I'll do the... There's an HSBC advert from Days of Yore. 
Anyway, ultra-orientalist. Might look at it in the seminars tomorrow if I remember. Cherry blossom. Symbol of China? Japan. I mean, these could be Japanese pandas, right? <laughs> um, so, we've got the... I mean, this is just... We've got uh, the, the bridge. I mean, is, is that a sort of European-style bridge? What else have we got going on? You know what I really love about this, actually? Because obviously I've watched this a few times and I've gone, hmm. What I love about this is that this panda is looking at this panda. Keeps checking. Because this panda is the teacher. This panda, and they've got to keep... Because when you do Tai Chi, you have to do it at the same time. This panda actually goes out of sync quite a lot, out of time. Because this panda, it's like teacher, advanced student, beginner. So this panda's going, what are we, what's the next bit? How fast are we doing it? And this one's kind of lost in, in, in its own kind of um, brush and push and everything. But this one's good. And I love that. The first time I watched it, I was like, oh, they're just all exactly the same. But they're not. Whoever did this has watched people doing Tai Chi before. Watch. Look at this. Look. <laughs> Look, what's the next bit? And then, and then, so this is an interesting point if we want to think about maybe cultural translation. So, so in, just in terms of the structure, we can do a basic um, semiotic analysis of it. And I recommend the easiest way to start an essay or a cultural analysis. You look at the signifiers. What are we actually looking at? What do they connote? Like, so it denotes, there's a fish, there's a little waterfall, there's a thing, there's a panda. But what does it connote? What does the sound do? Now, we don't need to be experts in studying music. We don't need to know everything about semiotics. We just need to know denotation, a thing that you see. Connotation, what does it signify? What does it conjure up? All these things working together. Now, we move from the digital world to the presumably analog world. That's, that's not an animated baby. That's an actual baby. And we flip from here. Now, listen. Listen to what is also said. Ah, oh, that was soothing, wasn't it? So, there were two versions of this advert um, made. One version has that the mother um, putting the pseudocreme on the, on the baby after changing the baby's nappy. The other version has a dad we well, only see the hands, but has a dad putting pseudocreme on, on his daughter's knee after she's fallen off a bike. So, we're all in advertising now. We're all selling some pseudocreme. This actually tells us how to interpret it. <laughs> tells us that all that stuff that we've seen before is soothing. Ah, well that was soothing, says the woman with the English accent. Well that was soothing. So... Semiotically, this is all carried over into the pseudocreme. So the pseudocreme is being sold to us as a soothing, healing, calming thing. Which means that that is what the digital Asia that we've seen is being constructed as. Soothing, calming, healthful, whatever. So this is how the advert is. It's got a lot of stuff condensed and then it displaces onto the pseudocreme. Because pseudocreme is just some, it's like a, some kind of barrier cream that helps with nappy rash. Isn't it? It's that kind of thing. It's just, it, there's, there's any number of these creams. How do you distinguish pseudocreme from your competitors? You go, well, this is kind of Chinese. But not actually Chinese. It's got all these healing qualities. So, we can view the small text like this as a kind of work of cultural translation. This is not just telling us to buy pseudocreme. It's playing on the semiotic connotations of Orientalism. But it's not a lie about Tai Chi. I mean, it's not. I don't know if pandas can do it. I, I don't know. Right? But Tai Chi does exist. It is a thing. And it could be regarded as soothing, calming, meditative. So this is like Saeed's point about Orientalism. It's not racism. It's not completely made up. 
but it's a certain way of representing and a certain structure of interpretation. This kind of flips it, this kind of is ironically playful with it. This is more like a postmodern kind of a thing because it's kind of funny to flip from digital China, digital Asia rather, to like putting some cream on a baby's bum. Like it, there's something quite amusing there. So you could, you could analyze adverts if you want. We'll do one more. One more. Um, there's all right. Okay. So you've probably seen these ones. These are more recent. The the Tai Chi pandas was about 2019. These are slightly more recent, I think. Yakult. <coughs> to create Yakult, one must release the mystical spirits of the beautiful culture. Down. It was developed by the Japanese scientist Dr. Shimota. Every bottle contains a world of wonder. No! It contains Yakult's unique bacteria scientifically proven to reach the gut alive. Magically alive. Stop it! Yakult, a little bottle of science, not magic. So, that's number one. The ancient Japanese hills hide the home of Yakult. A mystical essence distilled from the magical giant bonsai tree. And what nonsense. It was developed by Japanese scientists. Every bottle contained Jekyll's unique bacteria, scientifically proven to reach the gut alive. Magical bacteria. No. Magic. Stop it. Jekyll, a little bottle of science, not magic. So, this is interesting. Maybe not as interesting as the pandas because they're not doing Tai Chi, but what have we got here? We've got the the kind of um, the D the playing of a myth. So if you were like a cultural studies or cultural theorist of a certain age, you would say it plays Andy Razors, right? If you'd read a lot of Derrida and Deconstruction. It plays the Orientalist stereotype and it erases it. So it goes, oh, mysticism, right? Mystical Japan. But then it says it debunks it. So, but it does so in a way that if you are Roland Bart, right? You remember semiotics and Roland Bart and mythologies. Um, and what Roland Bart calls myth is a, like a little capsule of ideology that makes you believe something. When you, in the light of this lecture we've just had about the different myths of Japan. This one goes, no, 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 no. Japan's not mystical bonsai trees. Anyone who's seen the Karate Kid and listened to Mr. Miyagi and internalized his wisdom, you know that it's bonsai, right? <laughs> Go and watch the Karate Kid, the original one. It's not bonsai, it's bonsai, right? Um, so, one myth erected, Ridiculed, but a new myth is inserted in its place. So, Japan is science now, right? So we move from the ooh, ooh, ooh of the, the cherry blossom trees and all the zen-like stuff going on, and we flip into the... This is science, but it's also associated with Japan. Now, the interesting thing about a myth, and some people might say this might be where my analysis falls down, is that for Roland Bart, myth is something that's both true and not true. So, like, maybe Yakult was actually designed, discovered, invented, created by a Japanese science, or maybe that's been simplified so that it sounds good, right? So that, so that we can... Yeah we can use this myth, or maybe that's just a fact, maybe it simply was just some Japanese scientists who made up. But my argument is that in the structure of this advert, it's pulling in the newer myth about Japan. So there's no eradication of myth. The advert sets itself up as the, eradica the eradication of like mystical mumbo-jumbo. Let's not be orientalist, it says, but it's still being orientalist at the other end of the spectrum of orientalism. Yes? No? Maybe? Mm -hmm. Um, so, you can have a lot of fun with um, adverts. So where have we been today? 
we've been to digital Asia. Um, we've, in no particular order, we've done Saeed's formulation of Orientalism. We've looked at some classic formulations of Orientalism. Loads of Orientalism across um, Hollywood and every, all over the place, as you know. We did the Chris Goldie Jones with the, talked about magic and Orientalism. Um, and there's, there's more to say about that. Um, and then we looked at the question of digital age and looked at our case studies. We didn't do the spirituality stuff. What I might do is, is transfer some of those slides into the week four lecture when we look at... Um, I might start from there. The ones that I skipped over towards the end because I wanted to get to our case studies. Um, and then there's the question of what kind of conclusions do you want to draw from this? Now, this is not really one argument. So just the points that you've got, I wanted to give you the vocabulary, some critical concepts. So they can be your conclusions if you want. But, I mean... Here are some that I just kind of rattled off when I was writing the lecture. We can now say a lot about Orientalism. We can talk about self-Orientalism, both on the part of, say, the white Westerner who self-Orientalizes, right? Um, like, there's, there's a, there is a genre of martial artist who's, who is probably called, like, John Smith, who calls himself, like, Sifu Smith. And on his Facebook profile, it's got him like in like silken clothes with his fist in the foreground, and and I can't be doing with them. They wind me up. But why do they wind me up? What is it about that? Why do they wind me up and not the Chinese person who does something similar? Because of my innate kind of cultural <coughs> bias that. I think that it's only the authentic Chinese person who should be using terms like Sifu anyway. Um, so then we've, we've looked at self-orientalism. There's lots of different versions of this. We can think about this if we want. Digital Orientalism, structures of feeling. Like, what is a structure of feeling? Um, and I've recommended you look at the, the Raymond Williams if you want as extra. But a structure of feeling can be conjured up by the semiotic conventions we've, we've looked at in the little adverts. The sounds, semiotic clichés, the, the visuals, the colour scheme, the cherry blossom, Mount Fuji or Guilin, whatever. And then I've written cultural capital because the, all of these images, a stereotype can be a stereotype. Like, yeah, we can have stereotype about different ethnic or cultural or linguistic or class or regional groups. But that stereotype can also become a form of cultural capital, where you sort of identify, yes, I am that. You say I'm this, okay, I'll be that. I charge you £10 or less, right? Uh, or, or come and I'll give you a tour or whatever. And it's, so it's a complicated process. And then there's the question about, like, who is in, who controls these representations, these stereotypes? Chris Goto Jones argued that in Cyberpunk, <coughs> you've got Asia speaking back, you have Asia... Picking up the terms that uh, of the way that it's represented in the West and playing with them. Um, film directors like Zhang, Yu, Zhang Yimou have made, and Zhang Yimou did not just House of Flying Daggers, he also did um, The Great Wall. The Great Wall, have you seen that one? <laughs> where, um, where Jason Bourne goes to um, China and there's dragons. And, you know, it's literally like here, there'd be dragons. And it's an, ab it's an abysmal, orientalist, and terrible and awful film. And it has no redeeming features whatsoever. Because it's, the, it's got these most terrible stereotypical representations. But it was kind of Chinese made, but they knew it was for a transnational audience. This film is for the world. And what does the world want to see of China? It wants the Great Wall, it wants swords, it wants arrows. And it probably wants dragons as well, we'll try them out. Um... And then with techno-orientalism, techno and robots, technology, Asia, Japan and robots, and the dehumanising sense of, of the Asian character. So Spock, in the first Star Trek, in your classic Star Trek, Spock is a Vulcan who's incredibly logical, incredibly intelligent, rational, but has no discernible personality as such. And the theme between Kirk, James T. Kirk and Spock, is that Kirk's constantly like going, there is a, you have got a sense of humour, haven't you? You have, you are the same as me culturally, aren't you? 
And it's a kind of theme all the way through those first generations of Star Trek that the kind of alien character is Asianized and a bit dehumanized. And that theme is a constant theme within Star Trek and beyond. What we didn't get to today was the technologies and the spirituality stuff, which I'll, which I'll, I'll transpose that into week four's lecture. Okay? Uh